to buy computers will stay here and we will bring back the singers. <laughs> uh, I am extraordinarily pleased to uh, be able to be here with you. This is one of my, uh, my personal... Uh, uh, <laughs> one of my personal, personal uh, hopes and wishes, actually, is that... I think that computers can radically revolutionize the educational process around the world. And uh, the average age at Apple, as you know, is about 29 or 30. And uh, we haven't been out of college so long ourselves. At least most of the people at Apple haven't. And uh, it's very, very important to us. And I think that, you know, as you all know better than I, Europe is sort of a doesn't exist. It was just a word invented for the convenience of Americans and, and others. And uh, the fact that you're all here in this room uh, as a step towards cooperating with each other uh, in new ways uh, pleases me very much. It's uh, difficult enough to, uh, to get cooperation amongst the competitive universities in America. And uh, I think that that's great. Um, what are we trying to do here? What are we trying to do? The, you can have many views of what a computer is. My particular view is that a computer is a new medium. A new medium, one of the media, print, television, radio. And uh, a computer will, in the future, be looked at, I think, more in this way, as a delivery vehicle for software, just like a book is a delivery vehicle for its own kind of software. And uh, whenever we develop a new medium, we generally tend to fall back into our old habits from our old media. Uh, as an example, when the television first came of age in America, the first television shows were simply a camera pointed at a radio show. Uh, and it took about 20, 30 years for television to really come into its own in the late 1950s. Uh, we have this new medium of interactive video because of the laser disc, and what is the first thing we do with it? Uh, we put movies on it. So again, we tend to fall back into our old habits. Um, in the same way, when the personal computer was invented, we tended to look at it as a smaller version of a big computer. So we put COBOL and FORTRAN and these bizarre things on it um, and looked at it in terms of simple economics rather than the revolutionary nature that it, it really was. Do you know who Alexander the Great's tutor was for about 14 years? You, you know, Aristotle. And I read this. I became immensely jealous. Uh, and... I think I would have enjoyed that a great deal. <laughs> and and uh, through the miracle of the printed page, I can at least read what uh, Aristotle wrote without an intermediary. And uh, maybe if there's a professor, they can, they can add to that. But at least I can go directly to the source material. And that is, of course, the foundation upon which our Western civilization is built. But I can't ask Aristotle a question. I mean, I can, but I won't get an answer. And so <laughs> I, my hope is that in, in, in our lifetimes, we can make a tool of a new kind, of an interactive kind. And when I look at the personal computer, uh, we're, as you know, living in the wake 
of the last revolution, which, which was a new source of free energy. And that was the free energy of petrochemicals, right? And it completely transformed society, and we're products of this petrochemical revolution, which is, we're still living in the wake of today. We are now entering another revolution of free energy. Uh, Macintosh, as you know, uses less power than a few of those light bulbs, and uh, yet can save us a few hours a day or give us a whole new experience. And it's free intellectual energy. It's crude, very crude, but it's getting more refined year after year after year. And in our lifetimes, it should get very refined. And so my hope is someday, when the next Aristotle is alive, we can capture the underlying worldview of that Aristotle in a computer. And someday, some student will be able to not only read the words Aristotle wrote, but ask Aristotle a question and get an answer. And uh, that's, that's what I hope that we can do. So this is a beginning. Um, I think that, as you know right now, the computer industry is in the, in the tank. Uh, personal computers, big computers, everything. And uh, it's difficult, it's a difficult time, but I'm sure that Henry Ford had a few bad quarters back in the 1920s. <laughs> and the automobile had a sort of historical imperative. It had, it, it, the minute it was invented, it, it, a sequence of events had to happen. The same is true with the personal computer. Uh, there is a, a, a tremendous momentum behind this. And I think that this year may be a delay. This year we may look back and say, well, 1985 was a slow year. But it, there is such momentum behind this that it will happen. It will permeate and change forever our educational processes. And my hope, again, is that not too many generations of students will pass through before this happens. Uh, it will happen within 20 years. It probably will happen within 10 years. But it could happen within five years. I am uh, going back to the United States this weekend. Uh, and then uh, about uh, two weeks from today, I'll be in the Soviet Union for the first time in Moscow. Because one of my dreams has been to uh, sell Macintoshes in the Soviet Union. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the highest agendas, agendas on my uh, priority is to... Uh, is to get uh, them starting to think about exactly the same thing. So maybe six months or a year, year and a half from now, we can have some uh, Soviet schools here at our <laughs> Europe consortium meeting. But first I would like to say that I find it very interesting to meet Mr. Jobs. <laughs> arriving as he was, out of the blue. <laughs> and um, after making about three circles, so that we were certain to notice that there was something in the air. <laughs> and you can hear, almost hear everybody saying, there is something in the air tonight. <laughs> Anyhow, I feel somewhat, I felt somewhat like the uh, Finnish Prime Minister, Prime Minister, Mr. Karjalainen, when, when he was, he spoke a very bad English too. <laughs> and, and they had to pep him up heavily with language tuition before he was meeting Mr. Henry Kissinger arriving from the States. I don't think it was in a helicopter, but it was in a, it was in a big jumbo plane. Anyhow, they taught Kissinger the essential phrases, and these were welcome, nice weather, and lastly, how are you? And uh, Karjalainen, he learned those words, and he was very happy. Well, damn it, now he comes. I know the language. And out steps Kissinger, and Karjalainen steps forward to him. And all his teachers are very worried. Will he do it? Can he do it? Can he speak English? And he says, welcome. Oh, well, it. <laughs> and then he goes into the second phrase, nice weather, nice weather. And the third phrase, and who are you? <laughs> Well, 
Well, it was great meeting you. And I will start, stop making jo jokes with Steve Jobs, who is such a nice fellow and uh, is giving so much of his himself and his dreams. We have been very happy at Lund University for this association with Apple. I have never been worried that by eating apple, we should start thinking apple. <laughs> but uh, other people have been worried about that. I'm not so worried either about computers. Some people are. They feel that they will deform our minds. I do not think so. And I happen to think of yesterday something that other people have thought about many times, namely the, the relation to the car. When I came to Lund many years ago, after the war, a friend of mine bought a Volkswagen. You could almost call it a Mack Volkswagen. <laughs> and, and, and I said, what is it like having a car, a, a, an idiotic machine, which cannot think, it just it does what it, you tell it to do. And he says, it is like the seven-mile boots of the fairy tale. No, we have tales in Sweden, and one of them deals with the seven-mile boots. Boots that you put on your legs, and with them you could take seven miles in each step. And you got a huge distance by, carrying, by wearing these <coughs> boots. And to me, that was a wonder of the car, because with the car you could go seven miles without noticing it. And with computers, you can do a lot of things that you couldn't otherwise do. And with with weapons like that, or rather uh, machinery like that, the only problem is in the human mind and not in the computer. It's just like the boots. And uh, we are talking here about connecting many brains and many computers in a worldwide network which will hopefully solve all the problems. <laughs> I, I, I'm not entirely certain that it will but it will help, of course. The networking reminds me of a story of the, uh, the, uh, the building workers. It's actually a, a, an example from the school mathematics days, where the problem was, was if it takes seven days for six men to build a wall which is 100 meters long, how long does it take for 10,000 men? And the answer is just less than a second. <laughs> and uh, that is, I'm reminded of that story when people at Apple and other places tell me how we connect all the universities of the world, mm. and then if we have one really big problem, <laughs> we put it into the bitnet, and out pops the answer, even from Aristotle. <laughs> Now, finally, I've heard that Apple has been having some trouble. And we have always been very generous towards industry. We like to support it. <laughs> and, and there are no strings attached. Your integrity will not be broken. <laughs> and I think you need a fresh supply of uh, silicon oxide. So I would like to give you, Steve, from the University of Lund, this uh, unique piece of glass, Swedish glassware. It has the emblem of the University of Lund. If you put the Mac in, in the back, I don't mind. <laughs> uh, if you had been really hard, hard up, I would have sent it around for cash. <laughs> A final word. <laughs> Give my love to Mac Gorbachev.